I started playing flute in intermediate school, which is like fifth and sixth grade. We had a really cool band. <laughs> My band director, Mr. Browden, he would make us play all the songs on the radio and we would dance. So when we had concerts in the gym, the parents would come and they would just like get lit and be dancing in the stands and it was like a concert. So everybody wanted to be in band. Band was cool. It was cool in fifth and sixth grade. <laughs> and then? And then all of a sudden everybody left in like middle school, high school, but I stayed in it. So I remember in the fifth grade, I just wanted to be really good. I was like, I want to be really good at the flute. Everybody else was so bad. It was so hard to be good at it. it was, it's a very difficult instrument. I became like obsessed with being good. How much did you practice? A lot. Like, that time of my life, I was playing a lot by ear, but I wouldn't play like songs on the radio. I'd play like James Galway, like the man with the golden flute, and I would play the CD, and I would have the sheet music, and I would try to like play the sheet music, but it was so hard that I learned it by ear first, and then I would learn how to read the notation. So I was kind of like backwards. So you did it in reverse. Yeah. You learned it by ear first, and then you learned the notes, how to right. read music. Yes. But I learned how to play like the Carnival of Venice, which is like this really showboaty, braggadocious flute virtuosic solo piece by the seventh grade. That was my eighth grade audition piece for high school, which was this insane like and I learned that like by osmosis basically, by listening to it, by trying to get the sounds down, and then I would read the sheet music. I wanted to be the best <laughs> at a very young age. So it was kind of reverse. And like by the time I got private lessons, they were like, whoa, like, where did you learn technique? You're like a, you're like a wild horse. Like, and that's an amazing thing because you have all this power and you have all this style, but we need to give you some technique. And so I had to actually go back and learn how to like play notes properly when I got older. <laughs> it's wild. I know you said at first band was cool and then it wasn't so cool anymore. Yeah, you know, everybody, you know, grew up and, you know, you get the stigma like band geek or band nerd. But you stuck with it. I stuck with it. And were you a band geek? Yeah, yeah, I, I am. And I don't think you're a band geek if you're just in band. I was a band geek because I took band to the next level. Like I would, I would voluntarily go to band camp. Did you think flute would be the career? Yes, I had like dreams of being in a symphony and I was training or I was studying with the principal flutist for the Houston Ballet since junior year of high school. So she had put in my mind that I was gonna go to Paris after U of H and study at the Paris Conservatory and I was gonna really hone in my flute skills and I really saw myself sitting in a symphony. Like I wanted that. I didn't even want to be like a, a soloist. There are flute soloists that are popping off and they stand in front of the big crowds and they just play with a pianist. That terrified me. <laughs> really? I didn't like that at Why? all. Why? It's a lot of work. <laughs> you got to practice for a long time to get it right. I didn't like that part. I really loved sitting in a symphony and sitting in an ensemble and playing music and cre I would get goosebumps when we would play pieces. My dad's friends would come over, he would be like, all right, play that song for them. And I would like play the new cool, fast song that I learned. I'm a very showy flute player though. I like to show off. Like the faster and the more intricate the flute part is, the better. That's what you wanted to do, the is challenging it stuff. Raining? It's raining, yes. Yes, and I have to say that this is, you like the rain? It's Houston, baby. <laughs> <laughs> That's just the sky is sweating. That's it. <laughs> a lot of people think of high school as a struggle, but for you, it was college that was when you started to struggle? Well, yeah. I think with high school, identity and um, who you are in the world is a little bit more narrow and I think that you're, you're at the mercy of your peers, more so in high school, and what they think of you, versus like when you're dumped into a university or you're dumped into this place with all these people from all over the world, your identity becomes a little bit more broad and it gets a little harder to find your footing and find yourself. To figure because, out who you are. Yeah, suddenly you have all of these like training wheels taken off of your personality and you don't have those people that you grew up with to lean back on. And I was insecure about that. Like, there are bonds that 
I wanted to make, but I didn't even know how to make. And especially in marching band, I, I, I was more insecure in this marching band because I was that bitch in high school and Meaning, middle school. What do you mean? I was first chair, captain, flute uh, section leader, always getting the solos, piccolo player, baddest bitch on the field. They was talking about me in the streets. They was like, oh, I heard about you. You that piccolo player from A-Leaf. Yeah, boy. <laughs> I was that bitch. I would show up to the state competitions looking all jazzy. Like, I would have my cute outfits on. And they'd be like, oh, my God, why are you dressed up for these? But, you know, I was... I you was, were number one. Yeah, but then when you put me, you know, into a bigger pond, I wasn't number one. And I had to sit back and I had to listen to people who I'd never met before. And I had to take orders. And it is a community. It is a family. Um, it's an army. <laughs> What do you think band gave you? An outlet for my passion for music. I don't think I would have known how to articulate my passion for music in a creative way outside of just hearing songs in my head. Um, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> OK, God. <laughs> it gave me an outlet for my passion for music, for sure. It gave me um, my collaborative nature. Like, I love to collaborate. Even when I lived in Minneapolis and I was in um, making my little, I was making all these little girl groups and <laughs> I would go in the studio and there would just be like seven or six people in there. We would all just make a musical gumbo. That is, that's marching band. That's being in an ensemble. That's leaning on somebody and needing that support. And I believe in the one sound, everybody coming together to make that one sound. So how did your dream change from playing in a symphony to being Lizzo? <sighs> It was hard. I left college. I basically had to choose between flute or this other lifestyle that I was chasing where I was up super late with my friends, going to parties, trying to rap at shows, and it was, and then waking up early, getting to the band hall, rehearsing, being on the field, taking math class, which was torture. <laughs> I was juggling a lot of lifestyles. And simultaneously, in my personal life, my family was being, you know, torn apart. So I didn't really have that type of support at that time in my life. And my father had started getting sick, and my mom moved away because she needed to make money to support my dad and what he was going through and support her children. It was a lot. And eventually, I think I just kind of froze. I left music. I left flute, which was the most embarrassing, most shameful thing that I felt like I could have ever done, because flute was my whole life. And I kind of just disappeared. I went to, I went to stay with my, my mom for a little bit, and I just, for a summer, and I just disappeared. What do you mean, disappeared? I stopped communicating with all of my friends. I stopped talking. <laughs> I stopped, I, I really stopped participating in like the real world or what I thought the real world was. I had a whole life in Houston. And when I gave up on flute and when I stopped talking to my friends, I feel like I, that life just vanished. So what'd you do? I took a few months to go inside of myself and figure out what I was gonna do with my life, who I wanted to be. And for some really weird reason, I wanted to be a singer. And I hadn't sang any time before that. I rapped, played the flute, written songs, but I never sang. Did you sing in church growing nope. up? Nope. No. None of that. So I decided I wanted to be a singer, so I would sing B-Day by Beyonce <laughs> at night by myself or outside. Outside, what, you, what, what do you mean outside? Where would you stand? <laughs> so my mom, they had this like place in Aurora, Colorado. Mm -hmm. And at night, I would walk out and I would hike at like 10 p.m. And I would just, and it's like kind of like rural. And I would just listen to B-Day and I would walk and sing. Walk and sing. <laughs> I would walk and sing and it was not good. It was not good, I promise. There's stuff now, there's notes that I can hit now, but back then I wasn't hitting them notes. And I was like, I was delusional, <laughs> but I wanted to be a singer. And I was like, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go back to Houston, I'm gonna be a singer. So in three months, I went back to Houston. 
<sighs> and I tried it all over again. <laughs> what happened? Well, that was when I started becoming Lizzo and who I am today. Like I was Lizzo in middle school, Lizzo in high school as like a nickname. But I was like, I'm Lizzo, you know, I'm in this, and I joined a rock band. First thing I did when I got back, I joined this rock band. As a singer? As a singer, and they did. And the crazy thing for me was, I was so shy, I was so nervous, but I was like, these people don't know who I am. These people have never met me before. This is your opportunity to just go crazy, and I did. And, cause I was like, you can't judge me, you have no reference. So I just went off. And, and just, it worked? And they were like, we don't know what you said, but you killed it, so you're in the band. And I was like, yeah, cause I, I, they were on Craigslist, I auditioned. You found the band on Craigslist. I did. <laughs> I did. And it worked. And it, and it worked. That was fun. That was fun. I got confidence to be a front woman. I had confidence to express myself. Uh, I f found how far my voice could go. I did a lot of screaming back then. <laughs> Just kind of testing to see. Yeah, like the soulful voice that you hear now, I had to run before I could walk. So I was running. Just like with the flute, I started off like a wild horse and then a, my job or my life was refining or my journey was refining. So I had to refine my flute sound and I had to refine my singing voice too because it was like ah, 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 to like, okay, reel it in. This is not the Mars Volta. Like <laughs> bring, find some tone, fi find your tone. And so I did. <laughs> it was wild. There's pictures of me like on the floor rolling around. I was so nervous to sing, so I would like drink a bunch of whiskey and get really drunk and I would just go. And I'd be like, ah, 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 ah. it was crazy. So the self-confidence, like <laughs> at, when you were younger, did you, ha did you have self-confidence? Well, I mean, when I was born and then, you know, <laughs> when, I was, when I was precious and innocent and then the world took my self-confidence away from me, or that's not true, the world stacked all of these insecurities on top of my self-confidence. So I had like so many layers. Like of, what, what were of, you insecure about? I was insecure about who, like me. I was like, wow, this is, this is it. This is what I was given in this world. I was insecure about my body. I was insecure about my hair. My smile, you know, I did not like my, I would be like, <laughs> I was insecure about um, my personality because I was so different. I was so nerdy, kind of dorky. I was insecure about the way that I talked. I was insecure about my voice, everything. So how did it change? How did you develop the self-confidence? Well, I think it's it was years of tearing away all of those insecurities. I think that people think your self-confidence is taken away from you, but that's not true. Or that people think that like, we don't have confidence at the bottom of this, you know, or we have nothing, you know what I mean? But we really just have like layers and layers and layers and years of triggering comments and, and um, micro aggressive comments that we don't even realize are hurting us. But it's almost like a, I don't wanna exist type of feeling. But it's not because you hate yourself, but you just are done. And I never really had confidence that I could access. So at the end of the day, when it was like, well, I have nothing on this end and nothing on this end, what do I even have? And I think that I had just kind of zeroed out. I'm so fortunate that there have been people put in my life that support me, like genuinely support me and, and care about me. And not only do they want to support me, they know how to. And I think that that's a big deal because in my mind, I was like, can't nobody support me. Don't none of y'all know how to take care of me, even to my family. You were the only one. Yeah. We just talked to Taylor Swift, who's very much like, a, it's a diary what she sings about, right? It's mm -hmm. all very personal. What inspires you? Oh my God, conversation. Conversation inspires me. The first song I ever put out as a solo artist was called Batches and Cookies. And I remember me and my best friend, um, we were walking down the street, and she's featured on the song too. We're walking down the street and I was like, I got my batches and cookies and that's all I need, girl. Cause I guess I had some cookies with me and I was, I don't even know why I said it like that. And she was like, you need to write that down. Like that's a lyric. 
and I put it in a song. <laughs> I got my batches of cookies, I got my butt. And ever since then, I'm like, yo, like this conversation, like when you listen to my songs, it feels like you're having a conversation with me. And it's because everything that I say or everything that I go through or the funny things that my friends say or the poignant things that my friends say. <laughs> and maybe that's why people repeat your lyrics probably more than anyone else's lyrics, right? <laughs> yeah. Like you must hear that constantly, people yeah. throwing them back at you, right? <laughs> Everyone's called themselves that bitch, but have they called themselves 100% that bitch? <laughs> it's just things like that that make it more special. <laughs> There's a mantra that you have your live audiences repeat a mm -hmm. lot. I love you, you're beautiful, and you can do anything. Mm -hmm. Why do you have people do that? I know now, but I don't know why when I started it. I don't, when I'm on stage and I'm talking, I'm, it feels like a TED talk, like an unrehearsed TED talk. Like I'm just kind of, every crowd is different. I'm like, hey girl, what's going on today? And then whatever's going on in my life, I kind of bring it out. And I remember, I can't remember the first time I said, I love you, you're beautiful, and you can do anything to a crowd. But I felt like those people needed to say that. I felt like there was somebody out there that needed to hear those words. And it kind of stuck from then on. And I used to just say, can you guys say that to yourselves every night? When you go home, when you look in the mirror? It started as that, and they were like, yeah. And then it became this thing where it was like, say it, now say it to your neighbor. They turned to their neighbor. And I'm like, and then once I was really sad on tour. I think it was this year. I was so tired. <laughs> I was so tired. I was like, I don't feel like myself. Ugh. And I was like, can you guys say it to me? Because I really need to hear it. And they started saying it to me. And I was like, oh my God. This feels incredible. So now I know why you guys like this so much. <laughs> it feels good. I, I, everything about the Lizzo experience, whether you're listening to my music, watching a music video, or at a live show, feels good. I don't know, things like that just make my live show even more memorable and special and effective. Like, I don't want that feel good moment to end once you walk out of the door. You know, I want you to take this moment that you're feeling and I want it to be a part of your life forever. And I've read people send me comments on the internet and this one girl, she said, I just wanna let y'all know something. I've struggled with, you know, talking badly to myself and everyone does. Like we do it in ways we don't even realize. Like, ah, oh, so stupid, I forgot, I'm so dumb, I'm so sorry. And they're like, you're not dumb. Don't call yourself stupid. Like you don't even realize, like nobody tells you to not say that because we all say that. Or if you're looking in the mirror and you're like, oh, I look terrible. And your friends are like, no, you don't, you look good. But like, we do this to ourselves all the time. And she was like, I've struggled with talking badly to myself my whole life. And after one of Lizzo's concerts, I just started saying, I love you, you're beautiful, and you can do anything to the mirror. And she was like, it felt really silly at first, but I kept doing it. And now you will not even believe the difference that it makes in the way you speak to yourself. Like I went from saying things like, oh, you look terrible today to no, you don't, you look beautiful. Or reminding myself, you know what, guess what? You deserve this today. Like it just started this self dialogue that people don't really have that we should have more of. Cause we talk terrible to ourselves and why shouldn't we talk good to ourselves? You know, here's how I describe like, who I am in life. Like you get a lot of negative things that happen to you. You get a lot of engrams or, or uh, trauma in your life. You also have the opposite of that. You have good moments, highlights, but you can't really scrape away that trauma. That trauma just can't disappear. You can't just throw it in the trash. Like you have to go back to that trauma and just try to make some sense of it, you know? And I feel like with all of the things that threatened to cover up my confidence that I always had and that everyone always has on the inside, I had to address every layer of insecurity. So my body shaming, I would body shame myself every single day. Why can't I fit this? Or why do, does my body look like that? Why can't my back be flat and straight like my sister is? Or why are my arms so jiggly and lumpy? Like when I'm looking at my body and I'm shaming every little thing about it, I have to look at all of those things that I'm shaming and I have to find love in those things. What do you think about being this kind of role model for body positivity? I get nervous sometimes because I don't want 
things to become trendy. Because if it's if body positivity is in now, the fear is that at some point it won't be anymore. Right, right. And that is something that I try to combat every day, not on a personal, like individual level, just in general, by making sure that I'm putting myself out there in the world as this undeniable thing that is autonomous to me. And I'm not like subscribing to any type of hashtag or any particular movement. I don't move with other people. I just move with myself in my own lane. So it's not like, oh, all those girls that were body positive, you know, but it's like, no, then there was Lizzo who shot through during this body positive movement and made herself an undeniable piece of culture and an undeniable piece of um, history and, and music in the industry. So I want to talk about the metamorphosis of the music because you went, you said basically you quit flute. Yes. And now flute is clearly back in your life, Girl, big Sasha in your Bay. music. Sasha, the name of your flute, back. So explain to me how those reconciled. How did flute come back? Well, flute never technically left the career in flute where I was like, I'm gonna be a concert flautist. That is my life. Um, because I kind of snuck the flute in everything that I did. You had to sneak the flute a little bit in the beginning, yeah. The first time I played the flute was on the song dedicated to my father because he wanted me to play the flute so bad. And so there was this breakdown in the song and I would pull the flute out and I'd go and I went crazy. Oh my God, I played the flute in honor and tribute to him and people went crazy. People went wild. It made me feel close to him. It made me feel like um, I was doing the right thing and you know, it made me feel like I was continuing the legacy that he wanted for me. And once I started bringing the flute back in that way, um, <laughs> and she was always Sasha. I named her Sasha after Beyonce during the I Am era where she was I Am Sasha Fierce. So she, she'd been around for that long. But anyway, <laughs> so I played in the rock band, but then when I left the rock band, I, don't, I didn't think the flute fit in my other worlds, like my electro pop world or my R&B girl group world. Flute didn't really fit there. And then when Lizzo Bangers, my first like project came out, all of the samples on the album we had to replay and a lot of them were flute. Like the producer Laserbeak used a lot of flute. So I had to go in and play, replay everything. So, um, <laughs> so Sasha's been on almost every project, literally every project I've ever done. Cause then, but I never played her live. Okay, so then the next project was Big Girl Small World and I did this flute solo on one of the songs, but we like played around with it and made it all weird. So you can't really hear that it's a flute, it's just musical. And then on Coconut Oil, of course, I play the flute on the intro of the song Coconut Oil. And then of course, Sasha has her own solo on Cause I Love You on Heaven Help Me. <laughs> I didn't start playing the flute on stage until Coconut Oil, again, as a solo artist. And how does it feel now to play the flute on stage? Oh my God, the flute, she, Sasha has really taken a life of her own. She has her own fans. It feels incredible. Like they can't wait to see Sasha. Like when the flute comes out, like one of the dancers always brings her out and they just go. The fans go crazy they for go the flute. They go crazy. And then I got the flute and then they all just film it. And they're like, they tag her on her Instagram. She has Sasha be fluting is her Instagram page. Yeah, she's your got flute like, has your own Instagram page. She has 200,000 followers, I think. I think she's got over 200,000 followers. ridiculous number. Is it 100,000 or two? No, it's 200,000, I looked. Yeah, it's more than 200,000, She's got over 200,000 followers and she's not verified. This is insane. <laughs> yeah, they go crazy for her. It's kind of cool that the worlds came together. Well, I think that was my father for sure. He always told me that the flute was the way and I always told him that it was not cool. And I was like, dad, no, that's not gonna be the thing that gets me. And I, and I was so ashamed of it for a long time. And then as soon as I started playing the flute again on stage, like I did the, um, well, I was doing flute on my Instagram videos first. And I did the, doo -doo 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 -doo. I would did, it's Carnival of Venice. Doo -doo 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 -doo. And then I did um, the ASAP Rocky flute and twerk. I started, that started going viral. And then someone made a song from it, the flute and shoot song. And then I played that on stage and I played the flute and then I hit the shoot and then everybody went crazy. The whole world, I feel like, discovered me and didn't know who I was, but just discovered me and fell in love with me. And I literally talked to my mom about this. Like I was like, I 
literally almost could hear my dad being like, I told you. <laughs> the flute's the way, I the told you. The flute is the way. It took me so long, but you know, I always talk about this, like it's a testament to who you are. When you hide who you are, it makes it harder for people to, to get to know you and to love you, but as soon as you are unashamed of who you are, I was so nervous that people would call me a nerd or think I wasn't cool, but as soon as I showed the world all of me, that's when they started to fall in love with me. And we do love you. <laughs> <laughs> so this is kind of an obvious question, but what do you think your dad would think of this? Oh my God. Um, you know, I know he's extremely proud of me right now. I know that sometimes I have dreams where he's like managing me. <laughs> and I'm like, dad, stop. <laughs> but that's, that's what he would have done. He would have tried to he would have tried to manage me and be all up in the Kool-Aid. But he's, he's very proud of me. He propels me all the time. Like, I'm definitely in a place where, for the first time in my life, I, I'm smelling the roses. Like, I've worked really hard my whole life. Like, I've had my nose to the grindstone. <laughs> And I have just been, go, 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 go. You're not there yet. You're not there yet. You're not there yet. What's next? And this year, I promised myself in December, I was like, all next year, I'm just going to make more milestones and appreciate every single moment. And in those moments where I'm actually appreciating what I've accomplished, that's when I see him. That's when I see my dad. That's when I get to actually feel the love from my family and I, I can see their support for what it is. It's not like, ah, oh, get out of my way. I have a lot to do. It's like, oh, look at this like support system that I have. A lot is revealed to you when you slow down. But when I look around at what I've created and what I've built and the culture that's around me and, and the people that are around me, I, I know that I'm protected and I know that I'm protected by something even bigger than these people. Like we have an energy. Like, I don't know how to describe it, but it's, it's, I don't really have the words, but I know that it's because my father needed me to be here. What's the ultimate goal? Because clearly you're, you, you know the power of music and you know the power of words. Mm -hmm. I mean, you really are, you're a storyteller with your words and words are so important to you clearly. What's the ultimate goal? Well, ever since I was a little girl, I've always wanted to help the world on a global level. And it doesn't have to be very tangible. It can be an energy. At my shows, I'll be like, you know, I'm one bitch, but y'all are a bunch of bitches. <laughs> and you have the power to change the world. It's not gonna be one person. It's gonna be you that leaves this building today with um, a brighter outlook on yourself first, and then a brighter outlook on your life and therefore a brighter outlook on the people around you and your relationships feel better, you're kinder to people and then that person's kinder to someone else and then that person made that other person's day feel better and eventually the whole world is just happier because you love yourself and you don't have to take that out on anyone else. I think a lot of the times we're unkind because we, we're unkind because we're unkind to ourselves and we really don't know any better. And I think that if we all treated ourselves better, we would know how to love each other. Mm -hmm. We know how to love each other for sure.